and I'll be talking about uh, strong light matter coupling and surface quantum collisions. Uh, in fact, uh, the previous talk was a great, you know, uh, a, a great, uh, you know, I'll be following up on, on ideas presented in the previous talk. Um, first, um, let me talk, let me uh, thank my collaborators, specifically uh, Christian Eckhart, the gifted PhD student working on this. Uh, together with uh, Andre, Mohammed in the audience, and also uh, Michael and Anna. Uh, uh -huh. Okay. So, uh, the topic of this workshop is about topological phases and strong correlations in many body systems and light matter hybrids. As uh, John explained, we would like to use cavities, we would like to use these light matter hybrids in order to create all our favorite let's say, topological phases and strong correlations and so on. However, um, what I'll be discussing about in this talk, uh, that uh, there is a fundamental question on, on how to compute light matter coupling when it comes to electron uh, cavity systems. In particular, I try to convince you that this is quite a subtle, uh, non-trivial question. Um, and how you can make this, uh, let's say, uh, very, uh, this coupling to electrons very strong so that then hopefully you can generate all these interesting cavity matter phases. So in particular, I'll be discussing um, when the single mode approximation can fail in cavity uh, electron systems. Uh, then I'll move on to uh, make a rather bold claim that uh, the Fabry-Perot cavity cannot be described by a single mode approximation in the uh, context that I'll be discussing. Um, and then I will introduce a new plasmon, the surface quantum polaritons, as a very promising, first of all, to be described by a single mode approximation and also lead to ultra strong coupling. So to get everyone uh, on the same page, uh, the way we usually describe um, electrons coupled to cavities, we write down uh, uh, the minimal coupling electron Hamiltonian where light couples to <coughs> electrons by shifting the momentum mode <coughs> by the vector potential plus the rest of the Hamiltonian of the electrons. Then we do our single mode approximation where we approximate the vector potential by a single uh, cavity mode uh, and we assume that it's constant throughout this entire material. And finally we write down the combined Hamiltonian um, <coughs> combined Hamiltonian with the uh, electron with the Hamiltonian of the electron plus the Hamiltonian of the cavity. And this, you can solve it uh, again and again with uh, different electronic systems, different crystal structures, different electron-electron interactions. And what you typically get is a phase diagram of this type, where if you tune G and you make G very large, you get a very interesting phase diagram, uh, and you get uh, different uh, exciting phases. This is just a, a few examples where this Hamiltonian has been solved and can lead to, let's say, ferroelectricity, super radiance, magnetism, spin liquids, and so on. However, um, in, all this, uh, in, in all these examples, there is, this, there is this question, how do you compute G, and when is it even appropriate to use this Hamilton uh, using this single mode approximation? So, <coughs> Let me describe the single mode approximation uh, a bit more. Uh, the electric field and, and the vector potential um, uh, are given uh, through the cavity mode. And the overlap with matter usually goes as 1 over square root of this effective volume of the cavity. Basically, the more, uh, uh, right. And, and, and then uh, this predicts fluctuations <coughs> quantum fluctuations coming from the cavity that go as 1 over the effective volume. Meaning that if I put something in a cavity, the more I confine, the more I enhance these fluctuations, and hopefully I can then use this to change my ground state phases of oh. So then it goes, 
hand, hand in hand that the g that I predict is that is 1 over square the whatever effective volume of uh, this cavity has. But uh, there is a problem with this. <coughs> but uh, we first have to distinguish between two different types of cavity control of matter, matter resonant control. Here uh, we're thinking uh, about uh, a single cavity mode coupled linearly to a single phonon mode. Uh, and this is uh, I'm here, uh, Daniela's work, <coughs> where the cavity mode hybridizes with the phonon mode. And there, the single mode approximation is OK. And then this coupling is exactly what gives me the splitting between the two modes. However, when I want to change phases of matter, uh, the quantities that I need to compute are off resonant. And they usually uh, involve these local vector potential partitions that involve a sum over all modes. And then it becomes uh, uh, Way, uh, then there is not that clear that you can use the single mode approximation. Making matters worse, when I compute these local electric field fluctuations in free space, summing over all modes, these answers diverge. For example, electric field fluctuations go as the cutoff to the fourth, and vector potential fluctuations go as cutoff squared. So uh, then it's not even clear what do you mean strongly coupled single mode. Clearly, no matter how strong it is going to be, it's not going to be infinite. OK. So to answer these questions, <coughs> so um, in order to answer these questions, I'm going to use a multi-mode uh, approach to see what really happens in a fabric row cavity and a surface on polarity. And the approach is the following. In order to correctly calculate uh, what your photonic structure does, uh, we compute all the <coughs> eigenmodes up to some cutoff, both for the free space and the cavity. And then the observables that we compute are renormalized with respect to the free space, like in the previous talk. In particular, I'll focus on three observables, the electric field fluctuations, the vector potential fluctuations, and the electron mass renormalization uh, within the dipole approximation. Uh, I want to emphasize here that the vacuum fluctuations as if are infinite, the photonic structure fluctuations are infinite, but their difference is, of, is finite. And these are the results for the fabric perot cavity. So here, uh, D is the size of this cavity. And in order to understand what is going on, uh, I'm plotting here uh, <coughs> the density of states uh, as a function of position uh, in the fabric perot cavity. Uh, and I'm plotting it here as a function of frequency divided by the free space density of states. And, and you can clearly see here that I have some peaks. These peaks are the resonant modes of the fabric perot cavity. But if you zoom out, it looks as if the density of state on average doesn't change. And what mostly happens is that you're shifting. It really looks like you're shifting spectral weight from low frequencies to the first resonance. And then you just do this reshuffling of spectral weight to the resonances from lower frequencies. So then what is the electric field and vector potential in this case? <coughs> the electric field is the integrated density of states times the frequency. So this shifting at higher frequencies actually enhances electric field compared to free space. But for the vector potential, <coughs> uh, you have the integration of the density of states divided by the frequency. So shifting spectral weight to higher frequencies reduces fluctuation. And this is the first striking point that I want to emphasize here, uh, that uh, in the fabric perot you can have the vector potential fluctuations actually be negative. And this you could never be, uh, you, you would never be able to capture with a single mode approximation, which would always predict that is positive. Uh, and this is not, you know, bad in any way, uh, because increased 
vector potential fluctuations or decrease vector potential fluctuations can equally be used. Yes, please. I mean, I, I guess in, in this case, uh, it has to do with the magnetic field because we're using uh, a specific gauge. I guess, uh, but but uh, you're right. I, at the end, I will be computing the, the mass renormalization, um, which um, which is the physical property. Yeah. So so this is may not be physical, but. Uh, within the uh, gauge that we're using here does pop up in calculations. And then even to get the right, the sign, sign right might be a, a challenging and, and might need this uh, multi-mode approach. So <coughs> now I want to introduce, uh, let's say, a, a new type of cavity matter hybrid, uh, the surface form polaritons. And the idea here is that you have a paraelectric with a strong polar mount, where which you put on top your 2D material, and this 2D material then strongly interfaces with uh, surface phonon polarity. So this uh, paraelectric is described by this um, permittivity of a single IR active phonon. Um, uh, and, and the idea here is that you have the your IR active phonon coupled with uh, the light, and it leads to a, a lower, a, a, a lower and upper polariton with a Rastralen band in the middle. Within the Rastralen band, you have a flat band of surface phonon polaritons, uh, which is flat, so it have a, has a large density of states, but it's also all the way to very high momenta, half photon, half photon. And the idea is to use this to couple to, uh, to the materials. Okay, so this is quite a busy slide, but uh, I'm plotting the same thing. I'm plotting the density of states as a function of frequency, uh, as a function of position as I'm approaching the surface from above. Uh, in particular, there is a massive peak that appears here that corresponds to the surface phonon uh, polariton resonance, which when divided by the free space result just gives me something gigantic that uh, goes off the scale here. Um, and these are the results for the vector potential fluctuations and the electric field fluctuations. The first thing to note is this is the total number, that the total number is positive in both cases. Uh, and what I'm plotting here is the total and also uh, uh, the vector potential fluctuation excluding the surface phonon polarity. So this is the background of this structure minus uh, the vacuum. <coughs> and, and we see something that is uh, very small compared to the total. So the idea here is that the divergences of this background almost exactly cancel out the vacuum, and then the surface phonons can be considered as new modes that you're putting on top of the vacuum. And hopefully then you will no longer need to do this renormalization procedure and just add surface phonons as if they were new modes and not worry about uh, the, the background. And finally, uh, we compute the cavity-induced electron mass within the dipole approximation. Um, <coughs> uh, and here we find that in a fabric perot cavity, we find delocalization of electrons. This comes back from the fact that vector potential fluctuations are reduced. Um, however, for the surface mode, which rather than a spectral weight reshuffling is like you're adding new modes into the system, we see localization where this mass gets enhanced a lot. And as I get closer and closer to the surface, I can even achieve this ultra, ultra strong coupling regime where the change of mass is of the order of the mass itself, somewhere here. Uh, well, here, let's say it's 10 to the minus 6. This is, you know, 1. Great. So this is the summary. Um, and the summary of this talk is, um, so for different photonic crystal structures to really assess what they're doing, we need to use uh, a multi 
uh, a multi-mode approach and we normalize with respect to the vacuum. And not doing that can be quite dangerous as even the sign of our observable can be uh, the opposite. Um, and here I say that uh, surface form polaritons is a promising, uh, it's a promising platform because uh, it can be regarded as extra degrees of freedom on top of the vacuum. So then you can just use surface form polaritons without worrying about the normalization procedure. And finally, we can reach ultra strong coupling regime. And it's a, quite a convenient platform because you just choose your polar material that chooses the frequency of the surface plasma and you just place on top your 2D material that you want to couple to it. Okay, and then these are uh, previous works on how to use uh, graphene, HPM, STO, let's say heterostructure as a possible platform for further use superconductivity. Thank you. Thanks for the nice stuff, Maris. I just didn't realize, I didn't understand what kind of, for what kind of system are you computing its effective mass or its normalized mass? Right. Is the lattice model is a free particle. It's a free particle. So I, I should have uh, had a, a better illustration where uh, 2D material is, let's say, the next step. What I'm computing is an electron literally flying above it. Or, or in this case, I'm thinking about an electron literally flying in between. So this is in the dilute, let's say, limit of a free electron gas, where I don't consider, let's say, screening effects of the electron gas itself on surface plasmons that can be quite important and not trivial. Um, and you were saying that the effective mass depends on the fluctuations of the vector potential. Yeah. But this connects to Eugene's, um, because the effect, the, the mass of the particle is, of course, observable, but the vector potential is not. So it means a little bit somewhat. So unfortunately, I don't have. A, that, uh, yeah, I don't have a slide. Here. It was the electric thing that would be more. It would be more natural. That's what I would say. But the vector potential. Uh, right. So I, I guess I don't have a slide here, but uh, the. But maybe I can add a comment. Uh, this also. Yeah. But so is this what is referred in? in literature as local density of states versus density of states. What you call multi-mode here? Yes. yes. So the multi-mode is in, it can be K, but then this is like an equation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think you are recasting in terms of the vector uh, potential fluctuations, what people usually call the local density of states. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. But the density of states is not what is local density. But the, the structure potential might be actually a regular. It's just basically RPA for the mass. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so we do compute this observable mass. We do the transverse fluctuation, so it's just transverse fluctuation. Yes. Yes, yes, that's right. Um, that's right. We, yeah, we, just to be clear, we are all on the same page. We use this Hamiltonian uh, and we do second order perturbation theory, which is infinite. Uh, but if you subtract the second order perturbation theory in vacuum versus Fabry Perot, you get uh, a mass that is smaller than free space. So this is what we do. I, I had a question also about this. Uh, so, I mean, the first is in some sense a comment, like uh, you're using here the vector potential, but really surface quantum polaritons are made up mostly of charges moving around. And so you have the direct Coulomb interaction with the uh, uh, nuclei and electrons in the material, which is not described through a vector potential, but through the Coulomb interaction also in minimal coupling. So I'm not sure why you can represent it only through a vector potential. And the second, uh, uh, question is somehow related to that. I mean, I'm trying to understand. I agree with a lot of the messages you gave, but the effective mass renormalization, you're basically telling me that an electron close to a surface where you also said that basically the 
uh, free space electromagnetic modes don't matter much now, has kind of twice the mass effectively than outside, but kind of for calculating even the electron within the material, I don't need to change its effective mass if I do normal uh, kind of quantum chemistry calculations. So I'm trying to understand what does this effective mass really mean. Uh, right, so, so the idea here is how do you define ultra strong coupling? And when you have a band of electrons, there is no energy scale to compare to. So the only energy scale to compare to is something like the Hopping. So, so the width of this electronic band. So uh, the idea here is just to demonstrate how strong the coupling is. To demonstrate that in second order perturbation theory, you get a correction to the gradient that is as big as the band structure itself which means that perturbation theory breaks down and so on. But somehow that's our definition of ultra strong coupling. Uh, where where the, the, the change is as big. And, and to answer your first question, I think the fact that it's in fact fluctuating charges here is why it comes out to be as extra degrees of freedom. But I want to point out that uh, the surface plasmas are fully transverse outside the material. Uh, <coughs> um, you know, so they have magnetic field and electric field. Mm -hmm. And that's how we quantize it. Let's take the rest of the discussion offline to lunch. Uh,